our workshop today. I'm Abby. I'm going to be co-facilitating this workshop with Noel Smith. And yeah, so let's get started. So the En-ROADS um, Climate Workshop was developed by Climate Interactive, which is a climate think tank and MIT Sustainability Initiative with thousands of equations. It is a climate policy solutions tool. So we're gonna show it to you and we're gonna show you how to work it. So my name is Abby. Once again, I'm an En-ROADS ambassador. I go to Salisbury University where I study environmental studies and political science. I am the leader of the Salisbury University CCL group, and I'm the Student Government Association Director of Sustainability. Oh, now you can hear me. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Noel, and I am also an En-ROADS ambassador. I, I recently got my master's in um, sustainability from Harvard, so I'm excited about that. Uh, I am a chapter leader in Pennsylvania, and I'm also a liaison to one of our senators. So back to you, Abby. Thank you. Right, so just a brief overview of what we're gonna be doing today during our workshop. First, I'm gonna show you the model. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about it. And then you all will be going into breakout rooms to introduce yourselves and you'll have little groups that you'll work with for this session. And then Noel will do a demo where he'll show you how to work the En-ROAD simulator and you'll get to ask questions if you have any. And then we're going to have a debrief about um, how it went and how you can use the tool in your chapters and with developing in your region. So about En-ROADS, what is En-ROADS, right? I think we've all heard it a little bit. You know, we you signed up for this workshop, so that's awesome. So En-ROADS is a fast, powerful simulation tool for understanding how we can achieve our energy transition and climate goals. So you can do many things on the En-ROADS simulator. I'm going to show it to you in a little bit. But it helps decision makers understand the policies and investments that have the greatest impact in mitigating climate change. So we all know about climate change, but there's so many things that we can do to address it. So what does it look like when we do those things? It's hard to imagine. So that's what En-ROADS is trying to achieve. So it's a global model, which means that every action that you take on the simulator is happening everywhere around the world. It's not real, of course, but it's showing you what would happen if everyone on the planet were to do that thing. It's really effective for communication, presentation, and analysis. So. That's what the model is supposed to be. It's supposed to be for communication rather than like an exact prediction or anything. It is transparent. All of the equations and the structure of the model is available on their website. It is flexible, which means that the assumptions that go into the model, you can change them if you disagree with them. It is highly aggregated to be fast. It's very fast and very easy to use, user-friendly. And it's actually a bunch of models together rather than being one linear model that um, is just with one equation. It, it takes into account a lot of things, including feedback loops, which are a big thing with climate change. And it's good for grounding discussions to learn and strategize about uh, what you want to work on for climate change. So here's the model. Some of you may have taken a workshop before or seen the model before. It's actually changed a little bit in the last month or two. So now you can see that, I'm not sure, can you see my mouse? Okay. So on the left is global sources of primary energy. Before it was, it, they were lines and they're stacked now to kind of show you um, a little better. It, it looked a little crazy with the lines going everywhere, but now you can see clearly coal, oil, gas, renewables, bioenergy, nuclear, and then um, new, something new, new technology. And on the right is greenhouse gas net emissions that used to be temperature um, and now temperatures over here. And as you may notice, the temperature has actually gone down for predictions from 21 to 2100. It used to be at 4.1 degrees Celsius, which is amazing. I think we should celebrate that. It's um, mainly due to the decrease in the cost of renewable energy. So 
Yay. We can celebrate that for a second because it's always good to celebrate our wins. And then um, Noel's gonna talk more about how to work this model and what all this stuff means. So briefly, I know you guys probably know the science and everything, but I just wanna briefly go over it. So we know that climate change is happening, right? Atmospheric carbon dioxide is higher than any time in the last 800,000 years. Here's the graph 800,000 years ago to today. You can just see it skyrocket. So what is causing this? We know that coal, oil, and gas are the main three things that cause it. You can see how they make up the largest proportion. And then there's other sources. And then there's also land use changes, which isn't talked about as much, but <clears throat> super important. And then these are the actual gases that come out from those sources. So there's carbon dioxide from fossil fuels and industrial processes, which is the biggest chunk. Carbon dioxide from land use changes. Methane is a huge chunk as well. Nitrous oxide and F gases. So here is the baseline scenario. This graph is different than the one that I showed before on the right. This is the temperature change graph. So as you can see, 2020, we're right here. And the first line right here is two degrees Celsius. So that's the goal for the IPCC, the one that the IPCC put forth. But ideally we want to be at 1.5. So the goal that you guys are gonna be trying to reach today is to get as close to that temperature as possible. And obviously over here, you can see plus 3.6 degrees Celsius by the end of the century. And here's it in Fahrenheit. So we talk a lot about these numbers, but it's kind of hard to imagine what it would look like if the planet were to warm that much. So, what it would look like for three degrees Celsius is that the Arctic sea ice would be gone two out of every three summers. Uh, half of insect species lose more than half of their habitat. Uh, drought is significantly increasing in the amount that it's happening. And the area burned by summer wildfires in the Mediterranean doubles. Sorry, I had to move my little boxes over here. All right, so the very first thing that we're going to be doing interactively today is breakout rooms. And all right, I think everyone is back. So I hope that went well. I hope you got to meet new people and see some familiar faces. So I'm going to in do a, a little introduction to the En-ROADS en -ROADS simulator. But um, like I said, Noel's going to go into more detail in a little bit. So this is the panel, which was the bottom part of what I showed before. And it basically just gives a little bit more detail about what each lever is. So when you change it, you know what you're doing. So what I recommend is um, it will be sent in the chat, the PDF. If um, while, you're, while you're working on the, the simulator and trying to get to your goal, pulling this up on the side of your computer and kind of referring back to it so you can see like, oh, I wonder if this thing will, will decrease the temperature a lot. So what is it going to take to limit warming to the IPCC goals of two degrees Celsius or less than 1.5 or less than two and 1.5? So Noel is going to do a demonstration. Once again, here's the model. And I think that is. Yeah, you got to stop. Oh, yeah, yeah, this thank is you. Very simple. Cool, thanks. Right. So I'm going to share my screen and go right into the model. So let me know when you can see that screen. You can? Great. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, go through the, the screen and, uh, and just kind of give you some flavor for what I can do. So I'll just start with the top, the top menus across the top here. Um, you see you have a you know the simulation where you can you can reset your policies and assumptions which is really handy but i'll also say we have navigation buttons to do that you see this one here you can just click this one that says reset policy so if i change renewables and i said well let me go back to start i can always just reset my policies really easy and this 
this home button is resetting the graphs to the default graphs that are here. So these are really like key buttons because you're navigating and changing a whole bunch of stuff and you want to figure out how do I get back to the start? Well, reset your policy to an assumption here and you can reset your graphs here. So don't ever worry about trying new things. You can always get back really easily. There's a, there's a bevy of graphs that you can pick from and um, when you have more time, you can kind of parse through them all. But again, you can return to the default graphs right here very quickly. So if you wanted to, to look at a bunch of different um, graphs to, um, to, to get a big, better flavor on what's, what's going on, you can, you can certainly do that. So um, you can look at uh, coal primary energy demand. So if you just wanted to look at coal, let's say, or you could pick out, well, let's take a look at natural gas uh, demand and, and look at that. And then again, you can see as you, as you change different uh, policies, you can see how that changes that particular um, component. Again, if you were looking at one specific thing. So there's different ways to drill down into e each of the primary areas. Again, I can just reset that here with a quick click and I can reset my graphs with a quick click and get right back to the start. So my advice is poke around, change things, test them out, and then you can always get back to where you started by hitting them. Uh, impacts is an interesting one as well. We'll talk a little bit about this as we kind of navigate through it. But you know, we we have greenhouse gas net emissions as the uh, the net impact over here on the right, um, and, and you can change them this way as well. You, if you wanted to change this specific graph, I can just click on the heading and pull that same uh, menu down. And let's say you wanted to see what the um, sea level rise was over time. So again, there's the current model or business as usual, and you want to see how changing uh, oil might uh, change sea level rise and you can see it got a little nudge there. Um, there's different, uh, again, different ways to, to look at different impacts. Um, if you wanted to look at, and this one's kind of really interesting to me, as I pull up um, air pollution uh, from energy, or actually air pollution from, um, by, uh, by source, this is a really interesting uh, graph here. If I, if I, uh, you can see that um, coal, coal's got a really big con contribution to PM 2.5. And if I just like, let's price coal out of the market, you can see how the PM 2.5 goes, goes down very quickly. So again, a really powerful tool to, uh, to kind of see, well, what are the, some of the co-benefits that can happen as we try to reduce um, greenhouse gas emissions in the environment? So again, Heading back to reset my graphs, reset my assumptions and policies, um, different views. You can change how you want to see this. We're going to we're going to stay mainly on the well. We're going to stay on the main graphs for, for most of what we do in a, in a pretty short period that we have. But there's a number of other graphs that you can look in, in here as well. This is called a Kaya graphs, where you can look at a, a number of different uh, graphs at the same time. Cap per, um, GDP per capita, energy intensity per capita. Uh, CO2 emissions from energy, um, miniature graphs, if you want to even uh, put additional graphs in there. And again, all of these graphs move every time I, I, I change one of the, uh, the sliders here to put a policy in place. So if you wanted to see what that policy change did across multiple dimensions, you can, you can put up the, uh, the mini graphs to take a look at that as well. Okay, let me just go back. Again, I can just reset, which is a beautiful thing. That's the, the view, okay. Mm, yeah, play sounds. I haven't actually done that before. So if you wanna play sounds, you can do that. Maybe it'll give you a good thing. Sorry, right, let's take a look at, so that's the, that's the views. Again, what we're trying to influence is a couple things. We, we wanna see this temperature over here to get down to three, uh, two or below. Um, we get this, we wanna see the greenhouse gas emissions go down and of course, this is showing you how we're impacting the primary energy sources. So let's look at the levers. And as we get into our uh, exercise, when you go into your next breakout room, you're going to be testing out some levers and seeing which ones make the most impact to a global energy, or I'm sorry, uh, temperature in the, in the year 2100. The first biggest one, a group of, of uh, levers is called energy supply. And this is where you're probably going to see some pretty large impacts. So we can put a you can see where the, the, the dots are located in uh, different areas. So for coal, oil, and natural gas, they're over to the right because it's probably not a good idea to incentivize those. We want less of them. So we're going to say 
well, to put a, you know, a tax on coal, we would move this to the left and, and see what difference that makes. Same thing with oil, we can tax that as well and, and see what that does. Now, one of the interesting things, let me just kind of reset that real quick. Let's say I want to say what coal does. And I say, oh, I, I want to I want to see that again and, and view it. So this little um, replay button, if you click that, now you can just view the graphs and watch it. It'll it'll, it'll move it up and down three times, and you can see how that changed the uh, the scenario, which is kind of an interesting way to allow you to visualize the impact to the policy change that you made. And one of the other things I learned recently is, let's say I said, um, let's put a tax on coal and oil. So there was two policy changes I made, and I want to see both of those changes. If I click this twice, it should actually move both of them one after the other. So you can visualize two changes um, at one time as well to see how it moves the temperature, how it moves the emissions, and, and how it moves the source of primary energy supply. So that's kind of a neat tool. Again, I'll reset my policies and assumptions, reset my graphs. So if we look at any one of uh, these energy supply areas and we want to see well, like what are the details behind these sliders well, you can click on any one of these three dots if you click on the three dots it brings up the definition of that area so for renewables we want to encourage or discourage building solar panels geothermal and wind turbines and it defines what you know re renewable energy is in that box and it even allows you to customize how you want to um, incentivize it um, and if you don't want to just use the simple slider which is Again, I, I would recommend for what we're trying to do today and the time we have, the sliders are really effective. But if you wanted to get very specific and model a specific uh, policy proposal, you could you could model it into, into this in a very specific way as well. And then as you do it, you can see right here on the right what, what change that makes to, um, to the policy. You can see the graph on the right roof. So really powerful tool. Um, you can kind of see what, uh, yeah, so which which way you want to change that, when you want to change it. Um, and, and you can do that with each uh, one of the uh, these things. So, uh, so you know what coal and oil and natural gas are. Bioenergy, let's just take a look at what that's defined as. Uh, discourage or encourage the use of trees, forest waste, and agricultural crops to... Um, to create energy. So that's what bioenergy is in, in general. Uh, let's look at, uh, well, you know what nuclear is and renewables. Uh, new zero carbon is an interesting one as well. So let's take a look at what that is. So discover a brand new cheap source of electricity that does not emit greenhouse gases. So this is distinct from renewables. So it's, um, it's energy sources that don't emit uh, greenhouse gases, but it's exclusive of renewables because they're already a category for us. This is something beyond that what we do now. And it could be like a thorium uh, process. Yeah, thorium-based nuclear fission is an example. A again, so new tech that doesn't exist today. So you can you can select that as well. Uh, somewhat risky. You all, I think everyone knows what carbon pricing is, so I don't have to get into that too much. Other than when I do click this, you can see there's, um, you, could, you could simulate the, um, Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act uh, pretty pretty closely in this tool. It allows you the flexibility to do that. It is a little bit complicated to, to make it work just, just right. Um, it starts out with the carbon price today, uh, when you wanna start phasing in the new one, how many years, final carbon price, uh, years to start achieving that, and then um, years to achieve. So it's, there's, a, there's a lot here um, in, and you can, you can certainly model the uh, Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act, but I will, again, I'll, I'll go back to saying you know, sliders are really good and effective for today. And moving this slider on carbon price uh, all the way to the right doesn't quite come to the extent of the EICDA, but it, um, it is in fact um, a, pr a pretty good simulation for it. So, so that's energy supply. And then we have some other categories. Transport, so really simple. There's two uh, sliders here. Let's make transport more efficient. So uh, that could be fuel, fuel efficiency standards. And the other one is electrification. Uh, let's electrify. Uh, the entire marketplace. So let's just click on that. Let's let's move out uh, electrification of the transport sector all the way to the right and see what that does. So it does move the needle a little bit, but and, and, it, and it reduced, um, let's see, let's replay that. It reduced oil, the red bar, but it actually increased coal. So that's an interesting dynamic. It may not have been exactly what you thought it would be. All right, so reduce 
uh, electrification of buildings and efficiency of buildings, just like transport, uh, growth of the population and the economy. These are two sliders which um, you could also try to influence. And uh, I tend to stay away from them, <laughs> yeah, but you could uh, try to do that. Um, I'm, I, I, just, I just kind of cringe at trying to regulate population growth. Um, land and industry emissions, uh, deforestation. Uh, so you can see, you know, if you wanted to do things to stop deforestation uh, and carbon removal, you can do afforestation, that's planting trees. So saving our, our uh, primary forests or planting more trees, methane and other, uh, we should probably look at what that one says. So decrease or increase greenhouse gas emissions from methane, nitrous oxide, or the F gases. So this is, uh, you know, like cows, ag uh, agriculture, natural gas drilling, and things of that nature. So really important one there, you might find some use. And then carbon removal, we talked about planting trees, but also uh, carbon capture and sequestration would be in this technological realm here as, as well as direct air capture, which may be there. So there's a lot there. I guess if we do have a couple of questions, would it be all right to just answer them on the model now? Or uh, I see there's a hand raised. Yeah, no, no. Um, let me have Irene. Mm -hmm. Irene, you can, if you are you able to unmute and ask your question? Yeah, um, I think I know. I'm not sure. I remember having this question when I first saw En-ROADS. What does the position of the dot, the initial position of the dot on the slider, mean? That's uh, today. That's with uh, I, I guess um, status quo is what they're all defined. So that's the status quo. That's without any new uh, global policy. So again, this is a global policy that would be in place, and so. Um, that, that's kind of like, so for, for transport electrification, this is, you know, the status quo of what today's electric transport would be or the efficiency as well. And so what you're trying to do is through policies influence it one way or, mm -hmm. or the other. Okay. So that, that represents the current global number. Yes, sir. That's correct. Or position anyway, I guess there's no real number attached to that, is there? Well, um, I think we know what the um, uh, percentage of transport that's electrified today and, and what our kind of okay. global blend of um, efficiency is hmm. in engines. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. I'm just wondering, for instance, how does, how does the initial dot for coal relate to, I guess it relates to that graph right there. Yeah. I assume. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's status quo in terms of what it is today, but also um, status quo of what today's you know, I guess blend of policies are globally. So, okay, yeah. thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. Good question. Any other questions on the model? Um, we we don't have a question about the model, but um, this Abby or no, like you guys could answer this. Olivia had a question. What exactly is an En Roads ambassador, and what does that entail? <laughs> Abby, you want to take that? Sure. Um, an En Roads ambassador is. Me and Noel are both En-ROADS ambassadors and you go through training to be able to learn all about this model. As you can see, it's super complicated. There's like probably around 60 graphs that you can show. So basically what we do is we go through seven trainings and they're each about an hour long. And then you have to perform two workshops and you have to watch one. And then you can apply to become um, an ambassador. It's a really useful tool. Um, and I think we'll we be talking about it a little bit at the end. Yeah, and we, we can, can put a link out to that as well. Um, right, and we if, if you look on the bottom, it actually says right there, En-ROADS Climate Ambassador Training. So when you pull it up, you can like look and explore what it is. And I think Nadine just put it in the chat. Thank you. Great, thanks guys. Um, another question that just came in, is the reason for coal going up when electrification is increased is because some of that electric will come from burning coal and would that be encountered by raising renewables instead? Yeah, that's that's exactly correct. Um, if we if we just electrify our transport and don't change the, the grid, uh, we will burn more coal and uh, emit more emissions that way um, because um, that's, yeah, yeah, we need to, we need to change. We need to change both. And so one, it's, it's a really good uh, nuance. So when, when, when you go through this model, and I should have paused, try to think before you, before you move a slider, 
what do I think is going to happen when I move this and then see if it does happen the way you thought it would. And I, I gave that example of um, electrifying vehicles as one that may surprise you because it may, in, in, you know, induce more, more coal um, usage um, without doing other policy changes. Right. And the order by which you, you um, do a slider matters too, believe it or not. Um, so, you know, you can imagine if you, um, you know, put a, uh, a, a price on um, carbon, um, you know, putting a tax on, on coal may not have the same effect as putting a tax on coal without already a price on carbon. So the order by which you may put the policy in place could influence what that individual policy can do to the overall temperature. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If I can jump in um, just to clarify that point, the actions that you take first are going to be the most impactful. And sure. then if, like, if you take a, the thing my economics professor would always say is if you have like a lake full of trash and the, getting the first couple hundred pounds is like really easy, but it's getting like the little ones where it becomes more difficult and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Any other questions on the model where we get, jump back into the slides? Um, there aren't any questions in the chat, but one thing that came to mind for me is have either of you ever used the En-ROAD simulator in a meeting with a member of Congress? And if so, how did it go? I have not. Uh, it is on my list of things to do with my uh, my members of Congress with their, with their aides and their staff. Uh, I want to do that with them. But we are going to show, um, Abby will show, or me, one or the other, We'll show a bunch of slides uh, or examples, uh, actually a subset of, of the members of Congress uh, within our region that we know have gone through the trainings. So. Great. I don't see any more questions in the chat. So if somebody has one that they want to ask, then go ahead and write it in the chat. Otherwise, we will probably move on. Um, can also raise your hand if you have a question. Okay, I think, are we good? Yeah, go ahead, Abby. If I see any questions, then I'll just make a note of them for later. Okay, awesome. So next, what you're gonna do is you're gonna go into the groups that you were in previously, and you're gonna actually try to reach either two degrees Celsius or 1.5 degrees Celsius. So like we said, one person should be bringing up the screen and then you can try out a bunch, but the goal here is to try and design a simulation using only three levers. So that makes it a little bit more intentional in what you're choosing. So you're not just like putting all of them uh, to the max and you'll be able to see which ones are most effective. And so yeah, lower change in temperature is cool. Either two or 1.5 is great, that's IPCC. And how close can you get? Uh, you might find that it becomes a little difficult. So we'll talk after um, about how it made you feel and stuff. And what's the most effective lever? And then what other realizations do you want to share? So, so what we're gonna do now that you guys have played with the model a little bit and found your three levers, hopefully, we're gonna just take a minute to kind of process what you what you did reflect on how you're feeling uh, the model can bring a lot of mixed reactions from people so we want to give a space for that so you can jot things down if you want to or you can just do it in your head um, so we're going to start that minute now our time up awesome okay so we're going to do a debrief and we're going to have a discussion in here and what we're gonna ask of you to think about and speak about is how can you use what you've learned in um, your breakout rooms in your work with Citizens Climate Lobby and how can you utilize En-ROADS with your members of Congress or members of the public? So we're gonna call on people in order and um, you can raise your hand with the Zoom feature or um, you can put stuff in the chat if you have something to say. I think it would be really useful in doing presentations, not only because it is so powerful, which it is, but also it because it allows the people to participate more. So um, 
instead of having people just sitting back and listening to you speak, everyone gets involved. So I think it's really useful in that way. Thank you. I agree with Ellen, but whoever is doing the presentation needs to do a lot of practice because it's a very complicated presentation. Go ahead, Irene. Um, yeah, I uh, two things. Uh, it took us a little while to figure out how to make the carbon price look like the, the EICDA. I think we got there. Um, I hope so. Um, I'm glad you tried that. Yeah, we're going to uh, walk through that in a few minutes, too. Oh, OK. So I'm going to ask uh, one other question. But what that made us think about is, you know, it, it, we think we got it right. And we realized it didn't look like, you know, the silver bullet. Obviously, other things had to change. But one thing that occurred to me, um, you know, obviously, as you increase the price in carbon, the, re the fossil fuel uh, amounts went down and the renewables went up. And I always, I guess there's no way for this model to show, I always think about in terms of resource constraints, because so often they're ignored, you know, and you read about how much, how much fossil fuel power is required to build wood, wood wind turbines and how all the rare earths are in China and we don't have them. And so I, I, I assume that resource constraints aren't really figured into the model anywhere. I was just wondering, is that, would you say that's correct? Folks who know more about it than I do? Well, I think, um, I think it's more based on, you know, the market supply and demand um, to your point. Uh, though I will say, you know, we can drill into each of the, uh, in, in, into each of the areas. Um, I didn't show this very well, but um, when you hit the three dots and it brings up the, um, the model for that particular, uh, lever uh, over on the right there's a little i button for more information and it includes all of the assumptions that were built into that particular lever so okay. if they did have restrictions or if they did predict a uh, a constraint a natural resource constraint it would have been noted notated there uh, but i i don't recall them ever talking about natural resource constraints like peak oil or anything like that abby do you recall I actually just went in to look at it and I see it right here. So I went to simulation and I went to assumptions and it's the second one called initial resource remaining. Oh, there so you go. If you disagree and you think there's more or less, you can change that if you want to. Yeah, tool is really well designed. So if someone wanted to change the base assumptions like that, you, you, could, you could do that. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Abby. Jillian, go ahead. Yeah, um, something that was striking for me, well, a number of my colleagues that I've spoken to who are, I'm a scientist, so they're also scientists, um, seem to think that we are gonna get out of this, um, you know, solve climate change by by just technical, technological advancements and um, innovation alone. Um, and so I've always tried to, you know, say I, that's not true, but it's really nice to now have a, a tool that I could kind of point to. And I was just kind of, you know, dumbfounded looking at, oh, it'll, it, even if we have, you know, uh, highly increased energy efficiency in both buildings and industry and transport, we are only, we're going to still limit uh, temperature rise to only three degrees, which is still catastrophic. Um, and so I just, I just, that's a big takeaway that I'm gonna, and I, I look forward to sharing this with people, um, you know, whenever it comes up in conversation. Thanks. Nicole. This is a really cool tool that I could like definitely see being used maybe like a high school AP economics class. That might be a really good way, I guess, to, cause I know in high, when I was in high school there, other than like my environmental science class, it wasn't really explode, ex exposed to climate change in the topic. Um, so it might be a really cool tool for that as an idea. <laughs> so. Cool. Well, how about we um, 
go around each of the rooms and talk about the three, what was your three top levers and uh, what'd you learn from that? Um, let's try room one. What did you guys find well, out? Well, we had a question that was directly in the chat. I um, just want to address sure. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's get um, there, uh, Bill was asking, he'd like to see the numbers that correspond to the end point on the left-hand side of the chart. Does that make sense? So like, what are the numbers that are, um, or Bill, I don't know if you could explain it better. Um, go ahead and unmute yourself if you. Go ahead, okay. uh, for example, suppose you go into the technology, which is kind of broad, and you move it up to 50%. I would like to know how many gigatons of carbon reduction that corresponds to. Yep. So um, right in, in the tool, if I could share my screen, I can answer that, actually. I think. Would that be all right? So let me reset the model. And um, so you're talking about the carbon removal, is that correct, Bill? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, if I move that halfway up, then we wanna see what that's doing. If I click on these three dots, it's gonna bring up the detail for that. And it actually talks about net carbon dioxide removal. And this chart right here shows what that change is assuming right there, so. Okay, now wait a minute. It says percent. Does right. It does um it, no well, click this, on the i the, the charts gigatons this is not percent um so. okay so what i would like to know is what's the actual number on the chart yeah so yeah, this, uh, this is peaking uh, out right here if i mouse over it right there is about in 2060 about 17.72 gigatons oh okay so you can actually read it oh yeah okay great Can you do that on the left chart chart? On which the global sources of primary energy? Yeah, can you can you hover over that? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the, how about the left one? Left one. Yep. Looks hey, like great. It. Great. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um there was a there was a comment and kind of also a question as well that I just got. Um, Jeffrey says temperature doesn't necessarily stop changing after twenty one hundred. Might be helpful to see scenario under scenarios what temperatures will be like in twenty one fifty and in twenty three fifty. So I don't know if it, the simulator has capability of going that far in advance, but that's a really interesting point as well. That it's not like we just solve everything in twenty one hundred and that's it. I agree one hundred one hundred percent. I always say. Um... 2100 is an arbitrary number that makes sense to everyone. So yeah, I, yeah. If the model went further, I would love to show it too. I don't know, does there, <laughs> it's a good, it's a good point. And yeah, it's probably something we need to, uh, yeah, bring back. Right. I'm sure with the equations that they have, they could, they, they could do that. I, I think just for the purpose of like having it on a website, all pretty, that's probably why it only goes to 2100. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Agreed, hundred percent. Are there other questions before we get into maybe results? Did anyone? Did anyone? Did anyone hit two degrees with three levers? And what are the three levers? Let's go, Group One. And you can even um, share your screen too if you want to show your model. Anyone from group one? Room one. Room one. Uh, Francis, I unmuted you. I'm not sure if you're group one. I think. Uh, I'm group three. Okay. Well, you can go ahead if you want to. Yeah, please. Mm -hmm. You're muted, Francis. <laughs> um. We got down to uh, two degrees uh, using a fairly high carbon price uh, and using um, a decrease in methane and other uh, emissions and a technological um, fix, but our technological fixes were agricultural and biochar.
Okay, and I think there was a constraint on unmuting yourself. I think I just fixed that so anyone can unmute themselves and talk now. Sorry about that. And uh, go ahead, Joanne, you want to try? I think I'm, I think I'm group one. Um, yeah. Well, I actually just played around with it. This is a little like post group, but I did find a way to get to 1.7 with three lovers. Um, can you see everything? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you have a high carbon price, um, you also have uh, assumably a high tax on methane. Um, so probably like a beef tax. And then also are able to, you know, use technological advances to remove a high amount of carbon, you get to 1.7. I think that's what? probably, I don't know if there's a way to get lower than that with just three. Yeah. Be curious uh, if anyone else found a way. Yeah, no, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's really, that's really strong. Um, what was the, what was the, mo well, we'll talk about what's the most effective lever at the end. So yeah, that's a, that's a good one. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, and which other group? I'm not sure which group didn't kind of talk about their model yet. We were group two. Um, <clears throat> I'll share. I told everybody that I was going to share it. So I will go ahead and do that. We didn't use three. I'm just going to let you guys know that now. Um, but we, so here it is. Um, we got to two degrees. We basically put the carbon, pr we tried to structure the carbon price almost exactly as it would appear in the EICDA. Mm -hmm. um, and we also sort of thought that we could kind of make an argument that this was three levers because if you're deforesting, you're probably aforesting as well. Um, and electrification can be bundled into um, one electrification bundle, so to speak. Um, but I think the interesting thing about this is similar to what Jillian mentioned, you definitely need to be reducing methane, having technological advances. Um, and you don't necessarily need to do anything with coal, oil, and natural gas. Um, but I think probably similar to what other people found in their own scenario, we uh, noticed that, uh, first of all, the EICDA's carbon pricing standards are relatively low compared to what the simulator thinks is low, medium, and high. Um, and that by dramatically increasing the carbon price, I think up 850 is the top range. The simulator seems, there seems to be a lot more benefit to doing that than to what the EICDA currently has. We'll walk through uh, modeling the EICDA in a few minutes, but yeah. Yeah. So good. So what, what, what did everyone come up with? Like what's the most effective lever? Methane seems to be big. Methane's big, yeah. Carbon price, if you're willing to go high or able to go high. Mm -hmm. Sequestration or tech, other technological advances. Yeah, yeah, carbon, yeah, pulling carbon out of the air, which is uh, magic and expensive right now, um, would, would be one. And, and methane is, is, is another one too, but really hard to tell people not to, to get them cut, cut their dependency on, on red meat. Um, yeah, and, and of course, a very high carbon price is, is highly effective, yeah, so good stuff. Mm -hmm. Cool. How are we on time? Well, I think it's time to uh, hit on, on the next, uh, next slides. You want to head back to the slides? Right. So looking ahead, just to end on, well, we're not done yet, but end this part on a positive note. Um, we know that we have the tools to mitigate climate change. Solar and wind are growing and getting cheaper. We saw that with the recent update of the model. Corporations are investing in clean technology. Countries and states are stepping up and the general public is becoming more educated and engaged on climate. And the top insights is we know that there is no silver bullet to fixing climate change. You know, um, some actions are lower leverage than acknowledged. Many actions in many sectors are required, which I think uh, makes our climate work a little more sweet because then we know that at least we're working. It's not about working in the right section, you know, because we need a lot of them. Um, 
knowing that we can do it, we can avoid the worst case scenario. Uh, it requires keeping large amounts of fossil fuels in the ground and there are abundant near-term co-benefits. So that's one of the things if you click on the uh, details of a lever and then you hit the eye, you can see co-benefits, things that can be modeled um, that will happen. Like uh, people will breathe cleaner air, stuff like that. Right, and then I'm gonna give it over to Noel now. Yeah, so um, that slide there showed, uh, we can get down to about 2.6 with that one lever alone on the EICDA. I'm gonna pull up my um, chart here and share my screen and, and try to model it live. I hope I don't embarrass myself, but uh, we'll see, because it's, it's fairly complicated. Um, so if we, uh, let me just reset everything and go into uh, carbon pricing into the detail. Um, so carbon price today is at zero. Uh, we want to start phasing it in in 2021. Uh, years to achieve, uh, well, it's going to take, let's say, 80 years. The final price is going to be 815. Well, let me do that. Yeah. Uh, year to start achieving that will be 2021 and years to achieve the final carbon price. Oh, one year, that's what I messed up. Um, and then it takes 80 years to get there. So that's, that's, I think, similar to what the EICDA would look like if we started in 2021 or 2022, it starts going up and over it goes up about uh, about ten dollars i simulate it's, i know we got 15 the first year and then 10 so this just goes up 10 every year up through the end of the century and, and lands at like you know around 800 at the end of the century so that's a pretty good simulation for what the eicda might look like and you can see that gets us it should be 2.6 and that is so that's a fairly strong lever if you if you model it that way and, um, gets us from what 3.5 to 2.6 and, and almost a full degree drop in temperature by uh, implementing the EICDA, which is a fairly large carbon price. So did the group that modeled it in there, do you get similar results or was it a little different than what I'm reflecting here? Um, it was different, but I see that um, Irene's hand is up and she was in our group. So I'm going to ask her to yeah, please. Um, speak. Go ahead, Irene. Are you able to? Irene, are you able to unmute yourself? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Go now? ahead. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I was just trying to copy down all those numbers to make sure I had all the numbers that Noel mentioned. We just start at the top again and go down. Yeah. Quickly yeah. So, uh, uh -huh. so, so I went year, year to carbon price starts to phase in. I put 2021. Uh, years to achieve the initial carbon price, I put one year. So that means in one year, I could put zero years there, I guess. Um, uh, the final carbon price, um, 815, and I picked that out because it was 2100, um, and that's a rough estimation of where, where we would be. The year to start achieving the final carbon price would be, we start achieving it in 2021, it would take 80 years to get there. So I actually, I could have made that 79 years to hit the year 2000 or 2100. Oh, yeah. uh, okay, so 79, all right, and then... Yeah. And then uh, what? A15. Okay. Can you go down a little bit more? I'm sorry. I just wanted to make sure I have 79. And then the bottom one, the bottom number that you had in there is 100. Okay. Well, I didn't change that. That was the default. That's that's it. That's using a different method. That's oh, okay. Okay. Standard. So we're not we're not touching that. We're just putting a direct price on it. Right. So the four ones I changed was um, well the, the five. So you, the year the carbon price starts to phase in is 2100. It mm -hmm. takes one year to, to get to the initial price. Right. The final price I set at 815. And then I said, um, we will start to achieve that in 2021. Okay. And we're going to do it in 79 years. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's, 100. and then at the right, you can see, you know, kind of a visual of, of that. You can see that starts here and, and just goes up every year until we hit that 800 and so 
Looks like, yeah, I get to about 804. Looks like I'm a year off. I'm pretty close. That's a pretty good estimation. And Noel, you got the 815 by just simply multiplying the yeah, I just 10. Did. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it did in my head or whatever. So it's like, yeah. Yeah. yeah so we did, we did something similar to that. Um, we just didn't have 80 years as the final. We said 2050 as the um, final because that's kind of like the standard in terms of, you know, net zero by 2050. But um, we definitely had that sort of linear. Um, model on our graph prior to 2050. Okay. Mm -hmm. And did yours top out then at 2050 and stop going up? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I think the Ellen, EITA continues to go up. Yep. Mm -hmm. Ellen's hand was raised. Um, I, was, I was just going to say what we, where we went wrong. And what I'm wondering is, I can't see well on the graph. We usually say we would achieve 90% decrease in emissions by 2050. Does that show up here? It might be that it's just the U.S. Um, maybe because uh, yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. We take up a huge amount of emissions <laughs> of global emissions. So, okay. Any other questions on this? Or bounce out. One question that came up in the chat, Noel, but just before we forget is, um, I think we had shared this earlier, but just to sort of remind people, um, Karen asked if the model is publicly available, um, how socialized is it for use, and like, can she share it with her workplace, um, and can she use it for meetings with Congress members or in, just in general for other meetings? Absolutely. This is a public domain. Uh, in fact, they want people to share this. Yep. Share it, share it, share it, share it. Great. Could, um, Nadine, can you just share the link in this chat again for people? Thank you. And here is a link to uh, let's see if I can put it to everyone. There's a link. Maybe this will bring you to that to that simulation I just did. So mm -hmm. I think it does. OK, right. If you copy the link to the simulation, it will pull up whatever levers you've changed. But if you change the graphs, those won't pop up. Right. Okay, do we want to bring the slides back up? Last question, is there a phone app for this or something like that in production? Is it just desktop? I think for now it's just desktop. Every time I've tried to bring it up on my phone, it's been like, this is not available yet. So maybe they are working on it. Um, and then Noel, I believe you're sharing screen next. Okay. Can I do one more question? From the audience. Um, Bill's wondering, does the model consider methane decay? I'm actually embarrassingly not familiar with what methane decay is. <laughs> I think just that gotcha. it lasts, uh, you know, an average uh, half life much shorter than carbon dioxide. But um, they okay. that in mind. I'm not sure. Um, um, and I will check. Okay. No. Yeah, I. Um, I think we'd have to look at that um, assumptions there as well. Um, but if if that's what is going on today, and it's it's in our models, then it is reflected um, in in the in, in what you see here in Enro. So yeah. Mm -hmm. And then why don't the coal oil methane levers go down when we increase the carbon price? So like, why isn't there a fluctuating um, scale there? I think because it's reflected on the model because the coal oil and gas levers is if you were to tax them individually. So if you didn't want to do a carbon price and you just wanted to tax coal, that's when the lever would change. But like indirectly it is impacting those three things because all three of them emit carbon. All right, I'm going to bring up my share. Can you all see my screen? You see my, you see the slide, what can you do? All right, cool. So this is um, some of the areas that we can all participate in and kind of changing the paradigm and it really goes from personal and private meaning 
you know, donate money and time. You can go on a walk or, a, you know, a demonstration through sharing in your social network. And then it goes all the way up to the public and the cultural. And, and I really do think um, this is kind of where we play in CCL is up in the cultural area, which is changing norms and systems. Uh, but we also kind of go across these others. I mean, so certainly in a social network in the public area, organizing and voting. So we do uh, org organizing. Um, so we, we kind of span them all. And, and, you know, as an individual, you can kind of pick and choose, um, you know, where you can participate in kind of changing the dynamic to uh, move this forward. Oh yeah, so this is some great slides on, um, I got a question earlier about um, have any members of Congress gone through this training and, um, oops, sorry about that. This is um, Lisa Blount Rochester from Delaware. Uh, she's our representative. And um, that is the trainer that trained Abby and I as well, I believe uh, for uh, when, when we did our seven classes, he was one of the instructors. So. There was, there was some training done by MIT for Congress, and I've picked out, or we've picked out a couple of uh, examples of ones from the Mid-Atlantic region. Here's uh, Maryland 8th, uh, Chris Van Hollen. Uh, this, well, this is Jay, Jay Inslee, so he's just a prominent uh, member of Congress uh, in, a, in a climate uh, fighter as well. He had some nice comments here that you can see about um, how powerful the tool is. So that was a kind of a, a, a nice uh, validation. Connor Lamb, uh, I put him up here. He's uh, kind of a moderate Democrat from Pennsylvania. Talks about um, it, it, it's got a sense of integrity, scientifically validated. Um, David Trone from Maryland Sixth, you can see him here. Uh, he kind of put a nice comment at the top on friggin' believable. So he liked the, uh, I think he likes it. I think that's what that means. So you can see there's been a number of um, different members of Congress. Sheldon Whitehouse has also kind of given a, a, a comment of support for the En-ROADS tool as well. So the point of all, and this is just a subset, you know, when we pulled them from the MIT, there was many, many more members of Congress who had been through their training. Uh, we tried to select ones for, for this region. So yeah, a lot of support or a lot of knowledge in, in the area. And someone asked me earlier, have I brought it in? And I am going to try to do that with my uh, with with Toomey's office, though. They're really challenging to deal with in COVID. They don't um, they don't use like Zoom. Um, so I'm, they're always on voice only. So sharing screens with them is is really hard. Um, so I'm going to talk about the uh, so, so one of the things um, I think most of you, if not all of you are CCLers and and um, and if you're not, you're going to get a little bit of a kind of a um, very brief, quick tour on the uh, Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. But what I want to bring to light is like what, how, how you can use this tool. And, and Abby and I are available if anyone wants someone to run a workshop for uh, engaging the community. And that's what we've done uh, in, in, in some of our sessions is we engage the community, let them self-realize that carbon pricing is a really effective tool and then introduce them to the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. So we brought some slides over from, um, from CCL to, to add to our, our workshop. And like I said, if you are already familiar with that, uh, with this, that's great. Um, but I'm gonna just kind of walk through them as if you, know, you were an audience that maybe wasn't familiar with this. And so I would introduce the EICDA and say, it will drive down America's carbon pollution and bring ch climate change under control while unleashing the American technology, innovation, and ingenuity. It puts a fee on carbon, it gives the money back to households, and, and has a couple of other provisions that make this policy really work uh, well in today's political environment. Imported goods are subject to the same carbon fee at the border, it's called a border uh, adjustment. And then there's a narrow regulatory pause, only the greenhouse gas effect of CO2 and it's for 10 years. This avoids doubling up on penalties. It gives the policy a chance to meet some ambitious targets and it provides predictability to businesses so they can plan change. And if the targets aren't met, this legislation makes sure that those regulations snap back into full force after that evaluation period. So the benefits, um, it's, it's really effective, it works. 40% um, reduction in carbon emissions over just 12 years. And, and so that's a really important key to, to, to the policy is like, does it actually work? 
families uh, get benefits out of it, so it's good for people. Uh, a family of uh, four uh, in year 10 would get a dividend of about $4,400 in a, in a year distributed quarterly. So it, it does help families. And we find that it's good for your health. Uh, it's good for people, uh, provides a healthier environment. And you can even see in the simulator that uh, PM 2.5, which is like killing people now from burning coal, that gets almost eliminated from the environment. And so you can see here that um, 295,000 life saved through uh, 10 years of this just because of better air, air quality. So kind of a big deal on that one. And it's good for the economy. More jobs are created. So today um, there's a um, 240 billion in costs from environmental and health and uh, impacts of fossil fuels. And in the future, 2.1 new million jobs will be created over 10 years in our local communities. It's bipartisan, and this is important for legislation that's going to uh, span administrations. Both Democrats and Republicans see things that are beneficial in this. They're both on board and co-sponsoring the bill together, and we hope it remains that way. So if you want to get involved, um, you can join CCL. You can take action by uh, joining Citizens Climate Lobby, uh, visiting our website, and joining a local chapter. And again, you can you can get involved to whatever amount of uh, the degree that of, of input that you want to do. And there's also, if you don't want to join, uh, but you still want to support what we do, we ask that you just spend about five minutes a month calling Congress. And um, there's a sign up sheet here. Um, again, you can, uh, we can put that link in the chat, but basically it takes you two minutes to sign up and you'll get an email or a text on a monthly basis. And we provide a nice, easy, short, script and you get 99% of the time, you'll leave a voicemail for a member of Congress. And then they know that you um, that you want them to take action on climate, put a price on carbon, and it gives them the political courage to do that. So it's a, it's a really important, easy way to support what you saw today and to, um, to make this happen. And um, that's the last slide. So thank you all. And um, if uh, there's any last questions, I'll stay on and I think Abby will stay on as long as you want to uh, to answer them, so. Thank y'all for coming. You can you can head out if you want, but you can thank also you. stay if you want, yeah. Thank you, thank you for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Very, thank good. You. very good Thank job. you, this is very helpful. Cool. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. I have a random question. Yeah. Um, when was this created and how much has it been used so far? Um, let's see if Abby or I is faster trying to figure out how many sessions were done already. <laughs> I have to find that on the, on the uh, navigation. While he's looking, um, I think it was created in say 2018 does that sound about right Noel? yeah and there was one before that called c roads um, right yeah so they had a c roads tool which i i had no familiarization with i didn't know about it and, and that was the predecessor to uh to this tool so that was probably had a kind of a leaner interface and maybe more scientific and not generally for the public i'm guessing but um this is this is really designed to um to be for the general population I believe that their goal is to get one ambassador for every 100,000 people on the planet. And I think right now there's around 700 or 800 of us. Um, my screen? Yep. Yeah, so here's the map of where all the events have been held. Um, there's been 1,840 events. There'll be 41 after today. Across 69 countries, there are 676 facilitators and 47,008 people have been presented to. So long way to go, but um, you can see it yeah, looks like a uh, pretty, uh, pretty good representation across the U.S. and Europe. And so. Mm -hmm. Noel, is kind of um, piggybacking off of that, is this in other languages? 
It is, right? I think I saw there was a drop down. Right. Yeah. If you okay. go back, uh, there's a language. Yeah. Right? Like uh, okay. four, four languages, English, Spanish, Portuguese, and Turk. Okay. Turkish. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people in Brazil that use it. It's big in Brazil. Yeah. Yeah. And they keep adding to this because I think when I took it, it was maybe English and Spanish. So I, they've been they've been adding additional languages here. Anything else? This is super cool. Thank you all. You're welcome. Thank you for coming. Bye bye. Bye. Yeah, hi. So um, I'm a high schooler and I'm currently a high school sophomore. Um, and after today's presentation, like I was like, I was like shook and also like really, really interested. Um, so like, I was wondering, like my school has a, I go to, I live in Maryland, but I go to a boarding school in Massachusetts. Um, so my school has a sustainability coalition, which is like, um, we have a climate lobbying, like kind of like section of that. And we have like curriculum and all that. But um, like after the simulator, I was like, oh, this is actually like really, really cool. And I was like interested if like a high schooler can apply to be like an ambassador or like, or at least like conduct like some type of like kind of engaging with my school and my community about that. So I was wondering if that was possible. Yeah, Abby, you wanna take that one? Sure, yeah, it's totally possible. Um, I don't think there's an age limit on it. it I would recommend, I don't know, for me, I did it over spring break because I was like, I didn't have to do it at the same time as school. Um, but yeah, it's definitely, and it's really good to have on your resume when you're applying to things. So yeah, I would definitely encourage you to do that. And then you're in our group me, right? Yeah. I've played Among Us with you. <laughs> <laughs> we get, yeah, you can like text me if you want to. Uh-huh. Yeah. Or and this is just one version of the uh, workshop that you can do. There's a longer one, which, you know, you may find really interesting if you're doing it in school where it can take a full day and you have different groups like stimulate different, um, I guess, entities, you know, and, and they can then do negotiations. So the policy, you know, so you could have like the UN involved, some people being the country, some people being the oil industry, some people being another industry, you know, reps and you can you can then have these policy negotiations um, and, and see how you can because ours was easy we we could just we were just king for a day or queen for a day today so we could just move anything we wanted but in the real world it's a lot more uh, it's harder <laughs> you have to um, negotiate with a lot of uh, different diverse um, you know entities that have different you know goals right that's called the game. Yeah. Uh, the climate simulation game there's also a student assignment on their website that it's like a piece of paper and you can give it to your students and like you could do that in a classroom if you wanted to yeah. so would i just start if i wanted to start with um beginning the process should i just start with like i looked it up on the website like kind of like watch like training sessions and is that what i should start with yeah yeah, yeah. And you can do live training or you can watch the recorded training, whichever way is preferable to you. So I did recording because I would always like back up. What did she say? <laughs> I did live because I knew it would commit me to doing it. <laughs> True. <laughs> well, thank you so much for this presentation. Um, I learned a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Angela. Thanks. Thank you for coming. Thanks for the help, team. This worked out great. <laughs>